Welcome back to Five Acres Honey Farm. I just made English muffins from scratch and I've just put some butter and my honey on it. Before I dig into these English muffins, I want to show you this little butter bunny. I found it at a vintage shop out in Brofton, Western North Carolina. It's like the perfect little butter holder. Duchess cardamom is very happy that I just cleaned the coop, so now I can head over and take care of some more animals. I just cleaned the chicken coop and I'm going to get the high tunnel ready for the quail. I, I haven't really shared too much um, about how I'm managing the quail with the high tunnel um, in the past, um, but for, just for some context, last winter was the quail's first winter in the high tunnel. Um, so this covey of quail will actually be their first time in there because um, last year's generation has passed. And, um, and so what I use the quail for um, is that they spend the winter in the high tunnel so it's not as cold of an environment as if they were just gonna be in their typical run. And um, while they're in there, they are fertilizing the high tunnel, they're having dust baths, so they're aerating the soil a little bit and uh, they're enjoying pests. Um, they're also enjoying some weeds. And um, there's a few things that I like to do before I put them in there to make sure that they're safe. So one of those things is making sure the, um, the electric fence is set up properly. And um, probably last weekend, um, I rolled out the fence to make sure it was clean and, um, and in good shape. And then um, we mowed a perimeter around the high tunnel. So um, in some other videos, I've shared how we don't really mow very much. We typically just mow twice a year. And then per, you know, sometimes in between those mows, we'll do like mowing of pathways. Um, but we really like to leave the habitat for um, the native species for, um, for them to use. So. Um, we did do a little bit of mowing just so that the uh, electric poultry netting fence will have um, proper um, contact and actually like no contact with like leaves and grasses and things that could um, that could ground it out and make it ineffective. So that part's taken care of. We also um, tightened up the, fen the fence a bit, um, but I couldn't find like little landscape hooks because we really wanted to tighten the base of it around. So that's what I picked up this morning and I'm going to set up those hooks to finalize getting it tensioned properly. And then I noticed there were some gaps with the hip, um, not really the hip, but the baseboards on the high tunnel. And that just happens over time with the different temperatures fluctuating in there. So we, we happened to randomly stop at an estate sale yesterday and they have this like really great mesh that's perfect for what I need. And I was actually going to be putting um, kind of like a skirt of chicken wire on the baseboards. I'll show you when I get out there, but I really like this mesh mesh better. And um, so I'm gonna be stapling that to some sections where there's some gaps where um, maybe snakes and other things could get in. Uh, there are also some gaps like where the baseboards meet the ground. So I typically put like cinder blocks and some like two by fours and things like that there just for the season. So I'm gonna be putting those out too. And there is some weeding that I wanna do in the high tunnel because I learned last winter was a good lesson, was that the quail, there was a weekend we went away and I think they just didn't have enough food left for them that they ate all my carrots and they started eating some of the things that I'm growing in there. Um, but typically what I've found is that they don't really, um, you know, they don't really bother any of the, the plants that are growing in there. But this year I want to protect the baby carrots and some of the other greens and I'll be putting some inverted storage totes, um, clear storage totes over those plants and leaving the weeds and things for them to enjoy. But what's gonna be underneath the storage totes, I wanna make sure that part is weeded since that will just be um, sitting in there um, protected. So that's one thing I'm gonna do. And then the other thing that I'm going to do is make sure that the edges of the high tunnel where it rolls down are clipped shut. So I'll, that's something else that I'll show you when I get up to it. Um, but this is a really great way for the quail to have um, some more forage and not as cold of an environment. Plus they're pretty much working while they're in there, um, but they don't really know it. And um, then when it starts to warm up later in the winter, early spring, I move them back into their cottage and their coop area and that way I'm all ready to go for the season. So let's get out there and I'll show you what's going on. 
As I was walking over, I saw this hawk sitting up in the tree. Um, I guess it's a little aggravated that it can't get into the quail coop. But anyways, there is the high tunnel. So you can see I've got the poultry netting set up. Um, I do need to update you about the two nukes um, that are no longer here um, in the apiary. Um, but oh, I just heard the hawk moving around. Oh, there he goes. Goodbye. Please do not come back. Okay, you can kind of see how these, this poultry netting is sagging a little, so that's what I'm going to work on first. And all those orange lines are the hot lines. Well, it's not plugged in yet. But here are the guys, the bees, they're hanging out. And I'm actually going to go in there soon too, so we'll take a look. These are the landscape hooks that I picked up. So I'm going to use those to position the base of the poultry netting so that the orange hot lines do not touch grass or leaves um, or anything that's gonna ground them. Let's take a quick tour of the high tunnel before I get started. This is a lemon tree. I harvested one lemon this year. And this is a ton of weeds, which I'm leaving. Um, and throughout here, I've got kohlrabi, broccoli, um, some areas of just some more weeds. Um, there's um, some snap peas coming up, parsley, um, some volunteer potatoes from what I left. A ton of arugula. I love arugula. Baby carrots galore coming up. More broccoli. I'm going to kind of leave all this dead tomato and pepper stuff so that the quail can just kind of play around in it. Oh, but let me show you this. Do you see this? That is one, okay? Now, look at all of them up here. All of these are egg sacs from these writing spiders. And so there is one writing spider over here. Typically, when it's warmer out, there are dozens of these, this big, if not larger. And it's been really hard this season to actually like work in the high tunnel because they're everywhere. Volunteer fever fuse hanging out. Got some salads in here, some greens that I left all this buckwheat just to kind of die down. Radicchio, calendula, um, just a random variety. More broccoli over here, onions. I'm leaving the onions, more broccoli, some cauliflower, and then those beautiful calendula blooming back there. The wheatgrass, the quail love. So I did a little patch of wheatgrass for them. More broccoli, just a lot of broccoli. And I actually just sowed some more on the containers, but that patch of wheatgrass, I promise you, the quail will be playing in. Um, but I've got these fava beans here. Um, these grow so well and some more carrots. And it's just looking really good over it. Well, those, I think some, some worms got it, but I'm letting the quail hang out with there. <laughs> they can figure it out. Um, but all of this is just some, oh, actually, I got a few beets in there, which is good because I've been having a hard time with them. And this guy here is the moringa. I'll link to a video I did about Moringa. I don't know if it's dormant for the winter or if it died. It definitely gets below freezing in the high tunnel, but just not as cold as it is outside. More baby carrots that are distracting me. And um, more baby carrots here. And some things that I, I forget what I sowed underneath all of these old wheatgrass, um, sorry, wheatgrass um, hulls that are there. Alrighty, time to get started don't have high hopes for that stapler. I have a really hard time with staplers. Um, this is the mesh that I got at the estate sale. So I am going to um, kind of roll it up, see where it's going to fit well, and then cut it to size. But you can see it's not like super metal and like hard to move. It's much more like a screen. So it's really easy to work with. Um, and this is a little section. Oops, it looks like that a squirrel has been in here. So it's a good time to close up the high tunnel. So this whole section around here is where I'm concerned. And kind of like where these two boards meet is this gap. And it's hard to really tell, but it's probably like close to a half inch open in some spots. So that's where I'm concerned that critters can get in and out. Um, so I'm going to cut a piece of the mesh for here. I definitely was not able to use the stapler, so I need Mike's help. And I also forgot we have an appointment and we need to head out for a moment. Closer to Sitting on the bench. I mean, yeah, but it's probably gonna... Let's see what he does. No, oh, there oh. he goes. He's hopping up.
right, we scared the hawk away and we ran out for our appointment, which was to pick up a kayak. And now I'm just getting some extra sugar in the hives. So you can see they have eaten a lot of what I gave them already, um, but I have some more sugar to give them. Plus I'm going to give them some frames of honey from the mountain apiary since um, those bees won't be using it this, this winter. Look at that chunk of sugar and they are not happy that I'm pointing. So I will stop pointing. Uh, all right, they've got the sugar and then this really thick frame is an overfilled frame of honey and they're already snacking on it. So they're all set and I already went in the other two. Look at the beautiful pollen they're bringing in. I love how the colors coincidentally fit the holidays and they've got this red and gold theme going on. I couldn't help myself. I had to put little decorations on each hive. So I have these little wreaths for the hives and um, hopefully that'll kind of help guide them back um, during the holiday season when they're looking for the hive entrance. All right, the bees are done and I'm back to doing the work on the high tunnel and just wanted to show you, this is what I was talking about before, where the roll down sides meet the frame of the high tunnel. I use these clips to hold the plastic in so that the quail won't escape. Uh, however, I can only find three clips and I need eight because I do two on each uh, corner. And that means I need to go back to Lowe's. So um, I wasn't planning on putting the quail in the high tunnel tonight, but I still have to go back. I just wrapped everything up outside and I meant to update you about the two nukes. So. Um, what happened um, for my last video, I had two nukes set up in the apiary and those two nukes were actually the two queens from my mountain apiary. And the mountain hives have had a, I think it's like beyond my wildest dreams infestation of small hive beetles. Um, really, really horrible. Um, and they had, both hives had tremendous reserves of honey for the winter so they were like all set up perfect um but these hive beetles just took over and when i went to go check on them last month um the queen in one hive had a handful of bees left with her that were keeping her alive and the other one had half a frame of bees left so i put both queens in cages and brought them home and I set them up in nukes when I um, combined bees from one of the largest colonies here with both of them. The, the, um, those new workers accepted the queens and everything looked great for a few days. And then um, my husband and I went down to Florida to celebrate Thanksgiving. We had really, really cold weather here um, and I had seen that it was going to be cold in the forecast so I had actually added some extra honey into those nukes and then I sealed the nukes up and I brought them into one of our outbuildings so that they would be protected from drafts and I thought that would be enough for them um, to just kind of get through those few days and then once I was back I was going to get them more bees from some other colonies and um, and then my plan was to kind of baby them through the winter and like on cold nights I was going to put them in the garage which is heated and just like because they were so small and light I figured it would be not a huge lift to just help them to get through the next month and a half or so of really cold weather. About mid-January, end of January, the queens start laying again so I really was like if I could just get them through they would be good. I'm actually thinking now that I could have potentially just brought the bees with us to Florida and left them there for a few months and then brought them back. But, um, you know, that just sounds really complicated. And also my parents really aren't too fond of bees. So that may have not been the best thing, but something to think of in the back of my head. Um, so, um, Anyways, both of those nukes, when I got back from Florida, had not survived those cold nights while they were in the outbuilding. Um, they were completely uh, frozen. So um, it was really disappointing to see, especially after, you know, kind of babying them and getting them back here, getting them set up successfully and all of that stuff. So, um, and also those were just the most productive hives I've ever had, those, those two queens from the summer. 
um, this past summer out, out in the mountains. And what I am planning to do now is um, I've got three colonies here and, um, you know, winter hasn't officially started yet. Winter will start in about a week and a half. And once these colonies get through, um, probably to like early February, mid-February, so it won't be the end of winter officially. Whoever makes it to that point and looks really healthy, I am going to bring them out to the mountain apiary. So um, I am I feel good about bringing two colonies out there. Um, I much prefer to have at least two in both spots. So um, I'll kind of decide as I get closer how they look. And of course, by that time of year, it's a fairly comfortable time, at least here, where you could start to do some splits because colonies are starting to get big. Um, swarm season starts in February here in um, the greater Pittsburgh, Raleigh-Durham area. Now there's opportunity to make these three hives, potentially six. I don't really, I'm not, I don't want to ask for too much, um, too much work. Um, but my goal is to have, um, you know, two colonies out in the mountains, um, and and then a few here. Uh, ideally, I would like to have more colonies in the mountains because I feel like they have a more unadulterated forage to choose from. Um, it, they're surrounded by so much forest and they've got so many different trees to feed from and, um, and not so much, um, I feel like, you know, what do they call the food desert space of, of this area where there's so much construction and clear cutting happening that, um, that they're really competing for food. That's kind of what my thoughts are right now. And that's what happened to those poor two nukes. Um, I'm really, really disappointed. And I was actually considering filming like while I opened them and my reaction and everything, but I am really glad I wasn't doing that because I don't want to say I was inconsolable, but um, I, I, I'm pretty sad about it. So, um, so that's the update on the nukes. These look good, gave them their sugar. Now I am going to make some pasta and, um, make some, actually some extra pasta that I could put in the freezer so that I can enjoy it later this week and maybe do some garden planning, but we'll see. It's been a while since I've had like a good productive weekend like this. So hopefully you're getting a lot done too as we get close to the winter solstice. And uh, I will share some more soon.